Thank you for joining us. So we're here at the seminar on From Data to Action, the use of science for uh, sustainable development in Mexico. The event will be moderated by Dr. Teresa Cavazos from the International Research Center and Higher Education of Senada, Baja California in uh, Mexico. She will be presenting the different cases from the panelists. And I welcome you on behalf of the Inter-American Institute uh, for Global Change Research. Thank you for your patience and welcome everybody. Go ahead, Teresa. Well, thank you very much and good morning everyone thank you for joining this seminar we're going to be discussing different points today one of them is the international vision emerging from the results of the latest uh, report on impacts adaptation and vulnerability of the intergovernmental panel on climate change the ipcc we're also going to be talking about success cases on uh, dialogues between scientists and decision makers from different sectors and the government and then we're going to be discussing some differences and challenges to transfer the use of scientific information to development projects and for decision making purposes so for this, we have two researchers from Mexico, Dr. Sara Martinez Pellegrini from the Colegio de la Frontera Norte in Baja California, Mexico, and Dr. Simón Lucatelo. They work in different centers on this theme. So welcome, Simón and Sara. So today we'll briefly introduce the research topics, and then we're going to start a brief discussion amongst us and then we're going to leave some time for questions and answers from the audience so you can start uh, writing your questions in the chat i will give a brief overview of uh, dr simon lucartero he is a professor researcher at the institute of mora institute in the city of mexico he graduated as from master's degree on international relations from the london school of economics in political science in the UK, and he has a PhD in analysis and governance on sustainable development by the International University of Venice in Italy. His interests in terms of research include climate change, risk management, and international cooperation for the environment. He belongs to the National Research Center of Mexico Level 2. Simon is a invited professor from the International Governance School from the University of uh, Puebla, and he is an associate professor from uh, international affairs. He participates in different networks in, in the theme of international cooperation, citizenship, and international de sustainable development, as well as risk management and disasters. He has also been a guest researcher at the Research Center in the United States. He collaborates with different researchers at the University of Stanford in the initiative California Global Energy, Water and Infrastructure Innovation. And he collaborated with the Development Planning Unit from the University of the College of London and with researchers from the Bergen University in Norway. He's participated in several programs from the United Nations and the European Union. He's a consultant at the German um, at a German agency in different research projects. And last but not least, he's one of the researchers on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of the United Nations and lead writer of the sixth um, IPCC assessment report published only a few months ago. Welcome, Simon, and you can now talk to us about your work. Thank you very much. Can you hear me properly? Good afternoon, everyone. I think there are many countries involved. And so uh, greetings to all people participating in the seminar. Thank you for the invitation, of course, Teresa and everyone else. It's a pleasure to be here. So for a long time, I've been working on vulnerability and the impacts of climate change in different parts of society and in different physical spaces and territories. 
our interests are in coastal areas, mountain areas. And what we see is how the impacts on climate change transform societies in their adaptation processes to climate change. This is not an easy task because measuring vulnerability as a concept from the social sciences perspective is quite complex. It's not something, uh, it's something that includes several factors, vulnerability indicators. And so for a long time, we've been debating at a practical level that it's very different, difficult to apply and to provide all of this information to communities on how this is applied in terms of vulnerability and what being vulnerable means. So it's a multidisciplinary topic where we uh, gather different uh, colleagues from several disciplines and areas from uh, social sciences, to understand this this broad topic so we teresa has been working in a project in mexico on impact and vulnerability on climate change in uh, agricultural productive areas in particular semi semi-arid uh, populations in the north of mexico for a, a concrete example is uh, how in the last two 20 30 decades actually two to three decades, we've uh, been observing different impacts on climate change and how this vulnerability is present within communities and this how this has been changing as well based on the impact. So these analyses are conducted from different points of view with from quantity and quality point of uh, research. And we measure the capacities of these communities to adapt to and are undertaking to face this challenge. Then there are other things that we do in the specific case of the expert group of the United Nations to uh, include it in chapter 14. We analyze the issue of impacts that have been observed and the issue of risks and vulnerability of three countries in North America, the US, Canada and Mexico, which uh, for the first time the report uh, joins different regions. It's an interesting case of asymmetry in, term, in economic and political terms, but uh, we think of North America, where, including Mexico. But now the region in itself is North America because of the similarities that can be found and the same impacts that are happening, which are very similar for these three countries. Well, thank you very much, Simon. And yes, I wasn't aware that finally Mexico is part of these uh, North American group because geographically we are part of it, but many of the phenomena are being shared in terms of climate change with uh, the United States. And of course, the southern part of uh, Mexico with Central America. So thank you for your comments. I will now introduce Dr. Sara Eva Martinez Pellegrini. She is a doctor in uh, economic sciences, integration and economic integration from the University of Madrid, where she also has a master's degree in environmental management. She has social uh, diversity in within the work and she is a head teacher at the Universidad Norte since 2005 where she has been a general director of academic issues director of the department of admin public administration issues and head of postgraduate courses at the uh, University of Mexicali she now coordinates the uh, territorial management and agenda capacities uh, for um, policies and her areas of work are regional uh, economic development and uh, uh, regional policies. She has guided different students in the PhDs and master's degrees and she has published several books. She has also led different uh, studies where she studies uh, information between uh, producers of knowledge and recipients. She also had the project revalue of uh, indigenous peoples model of attention to indigenous peoples and a strategic plan on competitiveness innovation 
of selected activities from agriculture and farming in Baja California, the evaluation of consistencies from 2015 of the program of Baja California and the strategic plan from competitiveness in commerce, uh, services and tourism in Baja California with a closed step approach and a program for social development. Dr. Sara has also participated in the creation of the National uh, State Action Program on Climate Change on a chapter on public policy and strengthening of institutions and on mitigation actions and strategies for adaptation. Welcome, Dr. Sara, and please go ahead with a brief introduction of what you do. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And we're here from different parts of the world for this dialogue. I wanted to thank uh, Teresa and the IAI for this invitation. And I will now tell you a bit about what my presentation is. The introduction was more geared towards research because in a way, I am an economist and I started with lots of formalities, but those who work in development now know that we are more steering towards uh, closer to people because otherwise we stand at a more abstract level. If there are a series of elements of information that are very elegant on paper in, ex in terms of explanations, Sometimes it's difficult to understand why this is not reflected in different changes or actions on behalf of different stakeholders around us. So from this perspective, from the economy and from a political perspective, I made a change because in a way, all of this information, which is very valuable, or the information that we had that was more primary did not transcend. And so when I got to Mexico, I was lucky to get in touch with people who are very active in terms of public policies and in different models that accompany different projects in different stages. And the first stage could be associated with more academic diagnosis and formal knowledge than a second stage included more dialogue with a stakeholder that could eventually intervene and in some cases we could have intervention frameworks that were clearer as a result of the projects because otherwise we ended up having great publications that stayed on the shelves but this was not reflected in real life. And so this explains a bit this transition from projects that were much more abstract to these projects, which are much more uh, embedded in the public sector. I think that when we talk about climate change, we talk about our environment. And implicitly we're talking about development issues. And so it's difficult to separate the environment and the context from what this anthropocentric vision is in terms of development. And so perhaps you can, you can what, what do we mean about sustainable development? Well, we need to focus on development. So the projects have also been more geared towards sometimes the articles are more academic or of public policy, but we try, our, our team tries to, amongst researchers and students, we try to address issues more at a systemic level in terms of research. And so this leads us to, despite the results, we have a series of different lines or ways to address the issue, which leads us to have a more territorial vision and a timeline to see where things come from, but also how they can be translated into a specific context. And when we do so, 
we start to find different points that can be translated into a way of taking action because this allows us to work with specific context but it can also lead us to get in touch with different stakeholders and this leaves a clear mark within our projects and reconfigures the way in which we understand development sustainability and even how systems themselves work so can, they can be addressed in different ways but i think that one of the things from a social sciences perspective is to try to work more on a more systemic approach and the kind of issues that we are dealing with, especially when we talk about climate change, development, we need to include the social component, which has become a determinant factor. So how do we overcome these structures within projects and our research projects is, is becoming more meaningful. And in this case, we can set different links between these components. I think this also has to do with the transported situation we're in. I think being here allows us to have more openness because we are constantly interacting with different, from different perspectives, local, national, binational level, state level. And this all has different impacts on different perspectives. And the lessons learned are that we need to define our contexts constantly, permanently, and this forces us to have a more transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary approach. But this is an example where a context can lead us to rethink how we address projects, how we implement them, and what are the determinant factors that make this project more capable of creating more information. So unfortunately, or fortunately, because of the trans uh, border situation, sometimes we are more successful with different points in terms of climate change and development. I think I've exceeded the time and so I will stop here, but this is more or less the approach in which we work. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sara. And yes, in order to contextualize this to some of the participants from different countries, Sara and I are in uh, Baja California Norte, in the border with California. And so the binational transborder issues are very relevant. And when we talk about climate, this, there are no borders to it. We share a region, we share the, the same biodiversity, the same climate, and we share so many other different things. And so this context at a regional level that Sara was talking about is highly important. And it can be between states or in Central America, for instance, because it's so small, so many things are shared. And the same applies in different countries in Latin America. And so let's start with a brief discussion. And what we'll do is to start from the from a broader context of international guidelines. In this case, we'll be discussing the IPCC, and then we'll move on to from these international guidelines, how we can improve or mitigate the risks of climate change and how to transfer this, transmit this information. So I'm going to start with a question to Dr. Simon Lucatelo. From the perspective of the IPCC's sixth 
assessment report on impact adaptation of vulnerability that was published this year and from its research line on governance for sustainable development what actions should we already be taking to reduce the risks associated with climate change and in order to have a more resilient ecosystem and society and remember that Simone was a lead author of the of chapter four in this report. So please, Simone, go ahead. Number 14. Well, thank you. Um, I also have a few things that can help me explain, develop my points. I can share my screen. Let me see if I can share my screen. I'm not being allowed to do that. All panelists have access to screen sharing abilities. What if I make a co-host? Can you do it now? No. Don't you see this, the, the green button, share screen at the bottom? Let me see if I can do it now. Otherwise, I can just preview this. Can you see anything on the screen? No, sometimes it takes a while to load, but it should. Because you, you have screen sharing abilities in the seminar. Well, I can't do it. So perhaps later I'll be able to, to share my screen. But to start with, Yes, indeed. In this report that you saw this year, and that has been widely discussed despite the war in Russia and Ukraine that deviates the um, attention, there have been a series of reports that have been published in the last six to seven years, which are part of the sixth cycle of between four to five years on the meteorological assessment at global level. Along the UNMA, along with governments um, on climate change, invite the scientific community at international level to produce reports or studies related to the impacts of climate change in different sectors. So some of them can be on uh, from more so a social perspective because the issue of impacts adaptation of vulnerability is included but also there is the strategies and mitigation techniques to reduce greenhouse gas emissions for instance so in the case of our group work well i had the opportunity to work with different colleagues and especially with the uh, north american region what we tried to do was to revise the literature but also to see the state of the art of these uh, issue in terms of impacts, adaptation and vulnerability. And so there are a series of things that I wanted to share with you in terms of the results and what the actions should be from governments, because one of the things we know, starting from this last point, is that governments, not all of them, are taking actions neither in a coordinated nor timely manner to address climate change. So this situation is not ideal. The United States is also the case. When we started the report, Trump's uh, traumatic president's administration was in place. And that was one of the things that, at least in the United States, were being done to, they, they stopped being members of the Paris Agreement. And so this became a very complex situation where Mexico um, was Mexico was not coordinated in terms of addressing climate change. And so from the impacts as observed, four or five areas are important. First, the issue of cities. All the North American region has a population, a large population that lives in cities, small, medium, and, and big. Urbanization processes have been undertaken and there has been migration from rural to urban areas. And much of the battle in North America for climate is in terms of cities. And so there are a series of issues here where that make cities more vulnerable, not just because how cities are distributed physically, but also what the different components of these cities are in terms of mobility 
and the differences in income. These are all factors that contribute to, from the vulnerability point of, of view, make, us, make it easier to measure. And due to the natural and physical phenomena of climate change, cities are also, also catalyzers of extreme weather events and also of the entire ensemble of climate change phenomena. So the city of Mexico is an example, but there are many others, depending on the type of threat or physical natural danger that is identified. So as I was saying, in this first package, cities are a main reference point to understand what could happen. The second sector is linked to the interconnections between socio and systemic aspect, which is not just part of the city, cities, but also the relationship between different sectors, pro productive sectors such as agriculture and farming, among others. So these relationships that Sara was referring to, which are more systemic, are very difficult to understand because these are not linear. And so they're very complex and they have different perspectives. And sometimes it's difficult to see how they are differently affected, what the causes and consequences are between them. So these interconnections are an important focal point to understand in this report and to see the observed impacts. This would be the second aspect. The IPCC and the entire academia likes to have models and structures. I cannot share my screen, but as I said, we can see different perspectives on vulnerabilities and the famous result that you can see there. The diagram in the report is the link exactly between the different factors, climate, as a physical natural phenomenon and the issue of ecosystems. So it's this combination of different factors that have uh, lead to different results and to different readings of the impact of climate change. The other issue, the third one that I was mentioning in the case of North America includes topics related to water, firstly, not just between borders, but also water shortages, um, rainfall greater in certain areas than others but especially in the rock mountains there is a clear reduction in snow the reduction has been in by 40 percent in the last 30 years and this makes water reserve uh, reserves uh, more reduced in the united states so there is an issue, not just in terms of, of uh, a lack of resources, but also entails different uh, national and transnational issues. So awareness raising in terms of climate change and the impacts is also an issue in the United States. The Arctic is another case where the ice caps are melting and our colleagues from Canada are facing different political issues and the different countries closer to the Arctic in terms of trade routes and so on. But there are many, many things involved. But what's happening is that in Mexico, rainfall, especially uh, tropical storms are becoming more intense and more frequent. So there are a series of issues that are being debated at least those of us who belong to group number one include different angles, but there are a combination of natural and social factors that are combined. The other aspect is not just the uh, shortage of water, but also health that is not new, but was identified within one of the impacts that climate can have on mental health being exposed to high temperatures. This is related to very um, low temperatures as well that have an effect on different people in different, uh, from different ages. And so these uh, were some of the results from the report. Another point was poverty, especially in the case of Mexico, vulnerability is of a structural nature in the in the country, 
but climate change, as I said, has aggravated this vulnerability, existing vulnerability. I would conclude with this part. I don't know how much time I've got left, but could I mention something important of one of the results, which is a bit provocative for the debate, but in the literature review, the adaptation as an important element for climate change is not working. Mitigation is not working either, but adaptation does not have good news either. We're not adapting correctly, and maladaptation is a recurring word in the report, but evidence shows that we are having response, we are seeing responses, not just from a political point of view, but also in approaching adaptation, but this is incorrect. An example is the way in which we are react, reacting or adapting from an engineering perspective, civil engineering or infrastructure, for instance, in coastal areas, there is an increase in, in sea level rise. And how are we going to defend ourselves from uh, levels rising, from hurricanes or from extreme weather events? So the idea is to build walls, to build more resilient buildings. This could be one of the answers, but this uh, reaction is not uh, sustainable in the long term. So it's something that also arises and that's very important because it's not very clear apparently on how we should address adaptation. And I will conclude with this that limits of, to adaptation have to do with this idea that we're getting closer to uh, one point, the 1 1.5 threshold of temperature temperature average, which is the most alarming figure that we have for the planet and the, the most devastating effects that we could have in terms of climate change. And so if we are getting closer to this 1.5 degrees with the solutions at hand, we're not going to be able to develop the capacity to save part of the populations affected by climate change, nor are we going to be able to stabilize the world temperature. So the biggest challenge will be what we're going to be doing before we reach 1.5. And that half a degree before we get to two degrees is another debate, which includes different uh, challenges. So I'll conclude here. I hope I was clear. In any case, you can always ask questions. I will, in the meantime, see if I can eventually share my screen. Well, thank you, Simon. Yes, it's very important what you mentioned, that not to be so linear with so many of the different aspects that are relevant for adapting to climate change. And what you were saying about first page of this sixth assessment report, that human society adapts or adapts incorrectly and sometimes we have maladaptation issues because there is no long-term planning we just react to and find solutions but we don't find the optimal solution so this is something very important as well and for this we'll move on with dr sara with the second question on how results from scientists can be used by different sectors or the government to find long-term solutions. And so, Dr. Sara, you have led different projects in which there is an, an interaction or intervention between uh, the users of information. Could you tell us about a success case where this dialogue process between scientists and decision makers has taken place and what have been some of the challenges? And we now have 40 minutes. Well, perhaps we could have 45 minutes more. But in any case, uh, go ahead, Sara. Well, I will try to be brief, but I would like to talk about the program on Baja California for climate change, where several institutions participated. This document has uh, been drafted 
uh, some time ago, but it's part of what Simon has been mentioning. I think that in order to set this frame for the for where we got here to this discussion table, civil servants and uh, academic university members realize that climate change affects everybody. And it's not just the public sector and academia that can be the best uh, way to transmit the information. So in order to set the to frame this, I wanted to discuss three things that I believe are part of how we move forward. The first is how we see processes, as Simona was saying, from academia, well, the social sciences have the possibility to work with more long-term projects and to focus more on why and how. However, when we address different stakeholders, they are more focused not on the process, but on the effects and the results because they are going through all of this. So they're more focused on the short term. So these are one of the things that perhaps we have to think about when we address these issues. So how we can become more empathetic, how to transmit the language, but also the perspective from which people are seeing this. And we also work with different timelines. At the beginning, we can have this more long-term vision, but usually uh, the, these other stakeholders require action by six months or for the civil society, this can be a long time. For us, six months is, is hardly anything, but these are one of the uh, issues that we're facing amongst others in terms of success. And the third point related to all of this is results. What does success mean for us and for other stakeholders? Because if we don't bear this in mind from the big, from the outset of this process, it's very difficult that we can maintain these working groups that usually require time because we need to work in the long term. So having said this, I will now explain what the process was like for the DEAC. And it's a first-hand account because I was involved in this. In a way, we had three instances to work. Uh, as I said, we start working as we are more on the field. But we have, had a more technical approach where we had the first uh, step to reach consensus. And despite being in academia, it wasn't that easy. But first of all, we had the diagnosis and the effort to create a common language between the different disciplines and the different sectors involved. Because we all have different approaches. This was a very enriching process for us, and it allowed us to focus on the diagnosis from a more holistic approach and related to what Simone was saying. In a way, we tried to study the system, and this allowed us to include different aspects which were more physical, more social, or even political. So this is the first success element to to open up dialogues between the different disciplines. Sometimes when we think that when we are, when we open up, we are losing, um, we're not as solid, but this is not the case. In a way, we need to improve things so that the projects can be transmitted to everyone. The second stage was complications because This is subject to discussion, of course, but I think part of maladaptation is how we set priorities. And why is this? Because there are people who want to just overlook 
the deep changes and just focus on the shallow changes that were produced. So what is visible is important, for instance, how many kilometers were built for roads. And this is not necessarily the best intervention, not even in the medium term. So prioritizing this is important. And we've been having meetings at the beginning from the more technical perspective and from the academic academic perspective of diagnosis and though to reach consensus we worked on different tools for different stakeholders from the civil society and public stakeholders try to focus on mitigation and adaptation to work in the long term and we also try to categorize these in uh, cross-cutting issues or that involved different sectors because this was the other issue that we had to address, address especially in terms of public uh, works. So our technical interpretation had to match interpretation in terms of public policy and intervention because of course they also have a specific logic. As we try to be cross-cutting, they also try to do this, but then again, what different sectors are involved had to match. And this was part of the same proposal. And mitigation and adaptation for us meant uh, short, medium or long-term, and we try to set objectives from our technical knowledge with the technical group, we tried to also identify more medium-term responses in the case of Mexico, three or six years were needed to see results. One of the biggest efforts that we tried to, that we had to do from an academic point of view was to see how we could more or less invent medium term objectives more than to adapt more uh, and to make this more visible in the shorter term. It's difficult to correct maladaptation in which we're in but some of our efforts included creating this vision of how we measure progress and results. And the third stage included was try to translate this consensus to specific programs that were being proposed by the state. If you see, we tried to build from both sides and how we could get to a middle ground. And I think that there were two basic aspects, how we were speaking and perceiving this phenomenon and how this was being proposed to work on, because we have the interpretation of this issue from an academic perspective and knowledge, but we can't intervene. So. It depended on how we set this in more pragmatic terms. I think that we all learned a lot during that process, and especially from a social sciences perspective, we also lose sight of how we reflect our findings in social impact because we usually reflect this in more abstract terms for social impact. But this social impact is not necessarily how it's been perceived by the population and from the public sector or from the, the, the a, a regular citizen. Some from civil society organizations, which are groups that can have a particular perspective on what is happening and they can have their own interpretation, their own ideologies. And so I think that this process of prioritizing was key, whereby we did not include everything, what both parts would have wanted, but we did manage to have the main key elements for both parts involved to be glad with the results, the academic perspective and decision makers on the other hand. 
we could, as I said, eventually find some common ground. And this allowed us to negotiate certain first certain issues in the medium and longer term, uh, in the short and medium term. How would we measure this type of success? I would say perhaps that there are three main elements that should be taken into account. And I find it difficult to speak in terms of results and findings because we never consider them to be enough. And especially because this process of climate change is, is, is being quick, quicker than, than what we are doing and our adaptation strategies and model for human uh, behavior is being very slow. So we have many things that we still need to do. We can set this in terms of policies, but this is very much linked to daily actions of people within society, which makes it difficult to manage. And so I even sometimes think that we focus on big stakeholders, and I'm not sure whether they can find solutions in terms of pressure, perhaps a social mobilization could have a better response than on key stakeholders that have greater incidence. And this is something in which we need to rethink. Instead of having a dialogue with 300, we should be having one with 300,000. So this is what we should strive for. Well, the good news is that with social media, uh, this can be quicker and so we need to find a way in which this becomes more fluent in social media but also we need a lot to work on this quite significantly and as i was saying what would these success points be i digressed already but i think one of these success points is that dialogue hasn't been closed many of the stakeholders involved in this um, work have continue to be involved in different actions because something that happens often is that we start, there is a great effort, but the follow-up is not necessarily done in the same way as the initial effort. And so this is particularly serious with these issues which, are, uh, which have effects on the long-term. So we need to make sure that this is maintained and sustained through time. We would need to find other mechanisms to see how public policies can be changed. That I will conclude here. Well, thank you very much, Sara. And yes, it's a very complex issue that requires more time for discussion. But because we're reaching the time limit, I would like to have some time to see whether the audience has a, have any questions to ask. I don't know if any questions have been written on the chat. Well, we, we did not mention at the beginning that you could ask questions in the chat. I'm just looking at the time and that's why. Um, yes, I think that if participants want to ask questions, please, you can, ask them in the chat. And so Teresa can address the question to the right person or to the right panelist. So the chat is open for you to ask any questions that you want. Well, from, in terms of questions, what you were saying, Sara, in terms the difference between the timelines is very interesting and very important because as researchers, we always think of long-term solutions or with a long-term vision, but sometimes we forget that politicians have three years and they want to show results, something tangible. And so this results in maladaptation eventually. Well, let's see if anyone would like to just directly ask a question by turning on the microphones. 
Well, they can only do this if they are part of the main room. Otherwise, Nadia Itzel Castillo made a question. In terms of adaptation, what programs have been effective in Mexico? For instance, NWP exercises. Would anyone like to address this question? Yeah, I, I various. Very, very briefly, there are several adaptation programs that have been undertaken. There's, there is a, a national adaptation strategy as part of the commitments that Mexico has on uh, different aim goals. So there are several activities, mainly in terms of reforestation, adaptation in coastal areas and arid areas, and there are different activities being undertaken. But the problem is that many of them are not assessed. And so we are not sure and adaptation involves medium to long-term uh, vision. So what is being done is not just addressing independently mitigation and adaptation, but both things go hand in hand more and more so. Because through reforestation, we don't just adapt, but we also uh, uh, retain CO2, pollution, and so on. And so it has it plays a dual role. So there are big projects, other projects which are have been planned uh, temporarily. And there are many projects. I think in the catalog of uh, a national institute, there were more than 100 adaptation projects, but they all rely on whether they are at federal level, state level, municipal level. And so there is an interesting array of different possibilities in terms of adaptation. And currently, there is a big project, which is called uh, Planting Life. This was an adaptation for climate change based on reforestation. And I can see your faces. This sounds very difficult. And it's very difficult to measure as well. But the number of hectares and that are being used for this project is quite significant. On the other hand, there are other adaptation exercises in terms of water in the, the, in the borders of the north for resilience development, which is another project, uh, well, term that emerged in the IPCC. So there are many projects being undertaken, but that has to be a deeper assessment of these impacts. Yes, of course, all of these components are solutions based on nature, which both at national and international level are being uh, undertaken once again, because ecosystems and biodiversity play a significant role in our environment. And as you were saying, for instance, for uh, retaining CO2 emissions. Are there any other questions in the chat? Yes, there are some questions, several questions. Or you decide and you coordinate different questions. I don't know how much time we have left. One of them is, what is the predisposition of the official sector in Mexico to have an incidence in the environmental problems and in complying with international commitments? Would anyone like to answer that question? Well, I could perhaps address it first and then you can we can hear from the different panelists. I think that Sembrando Vidas is a program that has a significant component, but it's not very clear whether this is an environmental or social program, because there are a series of factors such as reforestation, which is more steered towards increasing production in rural areas in the country. So there is 
There are interventions between mediators to see what the right adaptations would be and whether what is being planted is adequate for each region and whether the practices are adequate as well. But I think what uh, is important in terms of predisposition is that these are good examples to try to have to include the social impact by involving the different communities. We need to work on with the different environmental and social elements at the same time. But once again, these are long-term initiatives. In terms of response to the international commitments, I think what is happening includes uh, public restructuring. We're trying to do a matrix on the institutional reviews on the environment, and it would seem that we would be going backwards sometimes in terms of who is able to do what, uh, resource management and the different competencies from the different departments. Do you want to share something with, it, with the rest? Yeah, just to add up on what Sarah was saying, I think that the, these are chaotic times because there is an official narrative which is not easily understood whether the government is in favor or against climate change. It's not very clear. Sometimes uh, there is a pro carbon disc narrative and then decarbonization, carbon neutral uh, narrative with the green transition in the next two to three decades. But then we see that there are many strange things, such as the other day I was at an event, you know, that Mexico launched a pilot program on emissions in Latin America. So this is a huge step towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And this is not an easy task either. It's difficult to work on this and to design and to implement projects of this sort. And in just a few months, we will have implemented a project. But then again, as Sarah was saying, we have social programs. And last week there was a dean or a representative from uh, a catalog on agreements with the United States that includes working in favor of reducing climate change effects. And uh, in terms of energy, it would include renewable energy sources and European companies in the environmental, in the energy, energy level. But it's difficult to interpret what these different programs involve. And we should also be reminded that states at subnational level for instance, the fight in climate change in the United States worked because during the Trump administration, state level went against federal level. In Mexico, some states have also uh, welcomed these changes and have been undertaking slow but significant transformation processes. So it's not easy to give a clear image. Sometimes it seems so ever-changing. Yeah, and what's important for Mexico as well is to uh, reset hazardous areas as part of tools to recognize what the most vulnerable areas are and to apply directly different programs that could be used to improve or reduce vulnerability. However, this is a complex process. because some states, such as Oaxaca in the south of Mexico, has 500 municipalities. And so this creates a very complex situation that could have uh, the mapping is very difficult because it's done at local level. And it's very difficult to do this. I don't know if we have other questions on the chat. I can only see one section in the chat. Yes, there is a, an additional question on whether you have experience with a joint management between the Central Administration of Academia for development projects, for training and research, for instance, 
in the Green Climate Fund. I don't know if this could be answered. It's a very complex question. Would anyone want to go ahead? We have some experience with some of the funds from different to the ones that are being mentioned. But we work mainly virtually. But they had more to do with uh, training mediators and uh, experts on this area. So to create um, these mediators, yes, as a center, for instance, the Euro climate program I'm involved in, the idea was to create uh, trainers on climate change from different perspectives with international funds. Yeah, this is another uh, issue. The public and private funding given to climate change and this is related to what Teresa was saying, but sometimes uh, they are uh, they come with a pre-format and working in Guadalajara with this would be very difficult. I think they're quite useful, but they, they would need to be translated at a local level for them to be useful. And also these type of projects are also supported by the IAI. It has this vision of including the collaboration of different countries, of different sectors, and for there to be this co-production between science and data and information that can be used by different stakeholders. And also training, which is very important as well to improve the situation at local and regional levels. Irene, ¿cómo vamos? <laughs> Irene, are we on time? Well, that's fine. We're going to conclude in just a few minutes. There are some comments, for instance. Recently, we had a work going on on vulnerability in the northeast of Mexico, and it highlights the absence of mapping, risk mapping in different um, ISO municipalities. But this, as added together with um, the different formats, what could be the way to uh, harmonize these risk, uh, risk uh, mapping and how they can become useful? Well, well this is part of a headache, but the risk mapping and vulnerability mapping. But in the case of Mexico, the, the law of protection specifies the issue of mapping to identifying dangers from natural or physical disasters, but not the social aspect. For instance, in the national and federal mapping for risks uh, is identifying different uh, sectors that are more vulnerable. But this invites the vulnerability mapping created to assess impacts on communities. And there are several tools that were mentioned, but there is no integration. And when we speak of data, the sources are very different. The way in which they are developed and the different methodologies can vary. And we also have municipal and national level research. And there is a lot of data and information. And the atlas is sometimes very easy to access, but some of them are not. Some of them have even been designed to be useless or they are not user friendly in any case. So in any case, it's a whole issue and it's a, a legal gap even where sometimes there, is, there are no answers. And so international cooperation plays a role. 
For instance, the United Nations provides support for uh, support for the risk atlas, which can be different from the state ones. So the vulnerability atlas available in Mexico also includes categories that can be debatable because they're linked to aspects which include social structural vulnerability because they're different types, but it's reduced to three or four categories only. But it's a whole issue, of course. And it's precisely this, how we use data and scientific information and how this can be translated to tools that can be then used for decision-making purposes. Well, this is a great challenge at national and international level, being able to have databases that are trustworthy and available to the public and that can be understood by the different stakeholders. That's something that is still pending both for researchers and as we say, as scientists, we create databases, but there have be, there has to be other uh, sources that can be used by different stakeholders and that can be included in the public instruments. So there is still a long way before we can get to that point. I don't know if there are any other questions. In any case, Irene, do you have any final comments? Well, yeah, we need to conclude this session, but I will I'll confirm that we're going to be sharing the link to the recording so that those of you who were not able to join us can watch the webinar. And this has been a very interesting session. It has been a privilege for the IAI. Thank you to Teresa Garrasos and Sara Martinez and the participation of Simon Locatello that we could learn so much. Thank you so much. And we will ask for your publications on the chat. We will ask uh, you to send us a selection so that we can share with participants and other resources as well. I think uh, Simon was not able to share with us his screen, but I think it will be very useful for our, all participants. They're even asking for the second part of this webinar, so I don't want to um, press you on this, but there has been great participation from all. I wanted to thank all of you on behalf of the IAI and on behalf of all participating organizations, the Mora Institute and the Colegio de la Frontera Norte. Thank you so much for your support organizing this event and of course the participation of Teresa Cavazos who is also a member of the scientific committee um, scientific advisory committee of the IAI we will conclude this seminar with this I don't know if you have any final words well just to thank our participants it was a pleasure to have the panelists present as well and Irene that you proposed this webinar and thank all the thank you to all the participants from different countries. It has been a pleasure to have you, and hopefully we will have a second part to this very soon. Thank you.